space to, to tinker on problems to um, solve things by making or by doing research and this means science has a, a big responsibility it, it is there for making the life of people better and th this should be done in the most efficient way in my opinion open science is one key part to making this more efficient to making better to from an economical perspective to return uh, in, uh, re increase the return of investment and um, not all the practices that we have inside of research are I think optimal they are partially grown historically and it's our task to question that and to improve science by making it more open and we, we have a few good examples where we saw that uh, yeah common behaviors have changed when when corona started people throw away the traditional ways of publishing and they went, for example, to Slack and we saw immediate and um, real-time exchange regarding research on, on Slack. We saw a rise of preprint uh, service. This means um, publishing or posting uh, manuscripts that are not peer reviewed to, to uh, preprint servers in order to make the access to this information quicker because we needed that. And I think we can learn a lot out of that and use this to increase the speed and the um, momentum of of what has started already several uh, years ago or decades actually already ago we also see a lot of digitalization so if we look around uh, we are um, surrounded by data we are data points we would generate data we we basically live in data and that is also one thing that is happening in science and that is good this digitalization is happening everywhere but this comes also with a lot of challenges and a lot of uh, new things to learn and um, to embed in our culture in our research culture and that is very demanding and it's happening on a quick pace and we need to take care that everybody um, is participating in this process but all that said we actually can go at the very beginnings of organized science and this year is the the logo of the royal society um, so that was uh, founded a few hundred years ago and they, this is basically the starting point where science happened in an organized fashion and you see maybe here this this uh, motto nullus in verba my, my latin is a bit rusty but let's say translating this means something like don't trust in the world or don't trust only the words which means basically if somebody has a claim uh, claiming that he or she found out something you can believe this but as a scientist you should question this you should ask for the data you should ask for the process you should ask how did this conclusion um, how, how was this generated and that is a key part of science and this means already at that stage at this early time the foundation for open science was there and i would i would rather say um, this is a core part of science and the need that we or the, the, yeah, the need that we need to talk about open science is actually not a good thing. It should be there. It should be trivial that we put everything open, that we make everything open, that we make our research transparent, that it's reproducible. That is basically set here already, and we are not yet there. And um, I would like to yeah discuss a little bit why this is not yet the case later on. And we, we see that openness um, becomes even more important with, with increased data that we have. And uh, as mentioned before, science is, as, as the whole society, generating more data. And that is good for open science that we have this digitalization that we can actually open up things, but we also have to do this. Let's have a look at the research cycle and, and how it's built up and then we maybe can understand better how open science is happening or what would actually open science means precisely. In, in the beginning of a research process, there's always an idea. I, I, for example, read a paper and I have an idea. Then I maybe sit down with colleagues or by myself and I design a study. So how can I get to um, a conclusion in the end? How can I formulate my hypothesis? What, what kind of data do I need to collect? What, what kind of process do I have to follow in order to, to well, confirm something or to reject a hypothesis? Often this is connected to resources. I need people working together with me. I need maybe uh, tools to generate data. I need experiments. So funding is kind of needed. Once everything is in place, 
the actual data acquisition is happening. So data is generated, can be also searched around. So if data is already available, I can reuse that. But basically, I need some data that I then put into a data analysis step. And this can be an iterative process. Yeah, it's a process. I sometimes first generate data. I, after that, analyze it and see, OK, there's need for more data, and I go back. In the end, I hopefully come to a conclusion or come to in new insights that are useful for humankind. So that basically that we um, figured something out, found something that was not known before, and by that making the world a better place and hopefully changing people's life by putting this out there. And basically a manuscript is written. That is currently the way how we communicate scientific outcomes. In order to keep the quality of such um, manuscripts high, we have a process called peer review, which means that um, a journal where I sent the manuscript to is sending this uh, manuscript to peers that are critically reading that manuscript and giving feedback and telling if this is, makes sense or if there's something needs to be improved or if this is complete uh, something that they would not support. And once this is the case um, that is published, the broad community, the research community, and hopefully also the broad um, society have then access to that manuscript. And well, somebody might read this and maybe has an idea and the circle is started again. That is very roughly speaking how research works. I mean, there, clearly there are a lot of uh, details left out, but this is roughly speaking how this looks like. Um, and let's look how this looks with open science. And there are several facets that we can actually have a look at and um, discuss a little bit further. Historically speaking, open access was the first step into open science because unfortunately, and this is still the case, although we are funded by the public, the final research outcome of these publications are not accessible by everyone. So people have to pay a lot of money and people means that university libraries, for example, they have subscription, although the content is generated by researchers paid by tax money. And this is, you know, mind blowing in a way. And if you tell these people not um, socialized in sciences, um, it's, 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 it's not understandable. And this is for me very understandable that this is not understandable. So it started over the open access that aimed to basically open up the, um, the final outcome, basically the publications. But all these steps in between can be also opened up. So for example, if you have an idea, you could post it somewhere and, and discuss it in the open. If you write a, write a grant, um, and there are platforms for doing this, if you write a grant, you can actually put your grant out, outside. And I can, I can say this, when I wrote my very first grants, I actually was, um, yeah, I, I would love to see more grants from my community in order to see which ones um, were successful and which ones were not. So in order to, to find a tone, in order to find um, a, a way to formulate things in a better way. And that um, can be a helpful part. In the actual data acquisition, a lot of things can be open. I can open up my methodology, so how I do this. And this is, uh, should be written somewhere in a manuscript, but it's often not, not as, as open as it should be. Um, we also see that uh, open net lab notebooks so that people, while they're doing the research, that they, for example, have a blog where they write and uh, what they did and what kind of results came out of this. And this in real time, basically. So it's, it's not, we have to wait until the publication there, but they basically put results already out there very early. Open data means they, that the data generated is later on available um, under an, an open license and can be uh, reused and that is uh, luckily meanwhile widely adapted not everywhere but it's um, it's getting there that a lot of journals are supporting this often uh, there is hardware required for generating that data and um, there's a yeah, kind of movement also to open up that the data because again Transparency is a, is a key part. And if you buy a black box tool, you sometimes cannot influence the parameters. You don't understand what is actually happening. So open hardware is another part here. And one thing that is pretty close to my heart as a, somebody with a um, computer science or bioinformatics background is open source. Because the, the step from translating data into insights today always, always, always needs software. And often the software is generated by the researchers themselves. And um, that is basically a skill that, that, that is needed, um, so basically to program in order to work today on, on data. And the results of that are as important as the data itself. So source, um, a source code of software can be used for basically, a, or can be a simple script that is taking uh, some data I have and 
translating it into a figure that is then ending up in a, in a figure for in, in an article, for example. It can be also a very sophisticated tool that can be used by a whole community. So there's a broad spectrum of, of that. And again, um, it's an important outcome out of the research process and an intellectual work that should be shared, especially as it's public funded with, with the public again. Um, if we think in terms of machine learning, um, models are generated. Uh, they um, are trained by, by applying basic training data and uh, we build models out of that and also they should be open and um, should be shared. Once we're in the process of compiling then the results into a manuscript, there are approaches where people put uh, basically their data or their thoughts somewhere and then they invite others to join, um, jointly write a paper and that can be very helpful to, to get new perspectives and new insights. I mentioned preprints already, so preprints are a brief way or a quick way to bring a manuscript that is not yet peer reviewed actually into, into to, to the public and um, gives the chance to get early feedback. And we saw this in the pandemic and the corona pandemic, uh, how this te technique was used much more and really in the life science this exploded. It was, it is in, in physics, for example, or mathematics, it's, it's since uh, several decades already kind of a standard, while in the life sciences uh, th that gained a lot of momentum, especially due to the COVID pand uh, pandemic. Um, also the peer review itself, which is usually happening in, um, yeah, under behind closed doors in a way, um, can be opened up. And this means actually that also the uh, the feedback that our peers are writing regarding manuscript are open and that they are basically well seen and maybe even ad allocated to the researchers uh, who wrote this because they spend a lot of time with this and that is maybe also a way of appreciation. So you see, we have a lot of different facets how we can improve and uh, open up actually the research cycle and all this should help to increase quality, to Im improve transparency, but also to make reuse of, for example, data or, or uh, source code or models um, um, possible. And um, that is definitely something that, that we need to aim for. There are also a few topics, um, yeah, I would say, connected to this that are also very important. For example, once we have open research there, we should also use the knowledge gained there to produce open education resources. We should embed a citizen into that. And that is also, I think, a key lesson out of the, the recent years that we really, really, really have to make sure that we don't lose the broad public in the process of research. And we have done, that. We, we, we've lost that because this is, this is uh, the, well, the results that we can see is that people don't understand how we come to certain conclusions and then things are criticized without a good foundation. So citizen science is a way of, of bringing more people into the research process and by that making them part, making society part of research. And all, all these kinds of things you need, need knowledge about open licenses. Now that is a fundamental thing and you should also, um, or I would personally also include SciComm, so scientific communication. How can I communicate my science? How can I bring what I found out to um, the, the person who paid me, the, the taxpayer, basically? And something that is also very important, in, 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 uh, luckily, the, the carpentries are actually really, really key here um, and, and driving this very strongly are things like accessibility, diversity, inclusion, and equity. And um, I'm, I'm very happy that the carpentries have this, these core values uh, really um, as a driver of, of the whole uh, community. Besides openness, um, in the recent years, this was uh, since 2016, the, um, the, I'm very sorry, this may start ringing right now. I hope this is not too, too bad here. Um, the FAIR principles um, were developed. The FAIR principles are kind of complementary to, to open science. And I will, I will show you this is kind of connected in a way, but uh, the FAIR principles aim to make research output findable, this is the F, um, accessible, this is the A, interoperable, and um, which is the I, and reusable, which is the R. And this is a very nice term, who, who doesn't want to be FAIR? And um, bringing this to this, this concepts to uh, to research data and also software is a, a big endeavor, and it's uh, that are kind of, uh, kind of leading principles for making research output um, yeah more effective in a way. And in a way, open fair is kind of um, complementary. Things can be open, but don't have to be fair. 
and things can be fair but don't have to be necessarily open. I just as an example, if I take my my genome for example and I sequence that. So I have a lot of uh, letters um, of um, um, nucleotides basically uh, as, a, as, a, as a file. I can put this on a server, put it on a certain license, and then it's, then it's kind of open. But if there is no metadata, and if I don't follow certain standards, it's not fair, and then it, things are not reusable. I can also make a complete fair data set, but not make it open, and just make it um, findable and um, and people then can for example ask if, if i give it to them that is then not really open so only if the metadata is there not the data itself it's it's not really open so these two um perspectives of these two kind of uh, principle sets are kind of complementary and ideally clearly research output is open and is fair so that is a key um combination that we should aim for today so I come to my very first key message, openness, transparency, and reproducibility are core values of science, and since actually its beginnings. And I hope we have, everybody agrees on this, on this. And luckily, since many years the community is working on that, and meanwhile, even organizations like the NASCO are pushing for open science, and that is great. And I still remember the time where this was not so obvious, where people were very skeptical of open, uh, opening up science. And let's face it, there's still research communities or individuals that are still very skeptical regarding this. And there are reasons for that. So there are reasons to not open up science so far. And I would like to address uh, them, or I've, uh, I'd say for me, there are three different ones, and I would like to address them in, in the following slides a little bit. So I think the, the, the key issues or the key points that we need to address are incentives and culture, infrastructure, and awareness, knowledge, and skills. And you can maybe already imagine that the third one is for us here, the carpentries, the key part that we should have a look at. But let's have a very brief look at the first uh, two ones. So in incentives and culture. As a researcher, I'm in a rather competitive system, I have to admit that. It's, it's basically the resources are limited and I need to write good grants, I need to write good papers in order to get resources. I need to get good people, I, I need to uh, get, get funding for um, making experiments, for buying equipment and so on. So there's a lot of um, competition ongoing and the, the, the problem is um, that I'm evaluated mostly by my papers that I generate, so my manuscripts, and not things in between. So th that means I would focus on that in order to, um, to get higher in the hierarchy or to maintain basically my, my resources. Now, if I apply for, for a job as well, uh, people will only look at my papers. So um, while I might have a... Um, I might have the tendency or might have really the deep will to put my data online, to put my code on all these kind of things and making this more open. That comes with a certain um, level of uh, resource I have to spend into this. It costs time doing that. And if the incentive system is not rewarding this, I might choose against this openness and in order to, well, use this resource for other things. This means the, the key part in order to um, have proper incentives means we need different measures. We need not to only look at the, at the final outcome, not only the manuscript, but also judging people by what kind of data they gen generate. How, what is the software they do? How open are they? And they're lucky there are even some job offers that definitely ask for presenting open science strategies. And that is, that is a game changer. We really need to change the system. We need to also make in our culture, in our research culture, openness a default. There might be some good reasons not to open up things, but that is really rarely, rarely the case. And if we use this in order to, to measure the, the, the performance, unfortunately, the performance of researchers, uh, we can change the system to that. And luckily, there are different um, initiatives like DORA, uh, like the Lagen Manifesto for Research Metrics that are basically aiming for this, in, uh, so roughly speaking, asking that people not are, are not only judged um, by, by uh, simple um, paper output and very, they're very bad. Unfortunately, this is often used in a journal impact factor, which is a very questionable number um, calculated on a very, yeah, on a, it's basically a very customer number. And that was used a lot, and we should not do it like this. And we should rather look what is the real benefit that the research is generating for the community. Okay, the second part is um, infrastructure. In 
order to make my research open, I need tools, I need services, I need um, things that help me making this easier. And if you if you have certain data that you would like to share, you need uh, procedures to attach metadata to it, to make it again, and if you think in the, in the FAIR principles, to make it findable, accessible, and all these kind of things. Basically, we need um, tools that support open science. So we need infrastructure that um, facilitates this process and makes it kind of seamless and, and taking out these gaps. If I have, a lot, if I have to spend um, a lot of time into creating my own solutions, I might not do open science, and here's a lot of uh, things are uh, a lot of things are happening here in the recent time. I can tell this also, especially let's say for the German and the European part. I see a lot of things happening, and we we are uh, as organization we are also involved in that, and that is good already. That is that is something uh, a track that I see, and that is very important to make it um, easier. And there's, for example, R33 data, which is basically a, a tool where you can search for, let's say, the repositories where you like to put your data. Often, due to the research committee, you are embedded and you might know this already, but otherwise, that it might be a good place to start searching. Uh, where can I put my data, for example? Where can I put my software? Where can I put my, my models once um, I would like to publish them? It's still something I... I'm missing. I'm, I would would love to have a really integrated way of of publishing a text, the code, the model, and the data all together. And currently, this is kind of scattered around. So this is a more more like a, like a like a call. Um, we need more integrated solutions. And if you look at the way we publish stuff today, it's still pretty close to what we what we do since several hundred years. And these manuscripts, or yeah, the articles, they are in 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 a in a uh, way around that that is not optimal and with knowledge graphs and other things we could do so much so much more but we simply don't and that needs to change in my opinion. But now let's come to the third part that is I think why we are here so we um, as a carpentry community and that is awareness, uh, awareness knowledge and skills and I think this is exactly the point where the carpentries do and can play a, a big role and i'm more than happy to be part of this community because i think we're doing very well here so what, let's let's think back to 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 this image and, and look around here so we have, we have many different facets and we need to open up all these kind of step, steps so if we think about this that is not easy that actually is not something i can ask somebody who basically for example um, finishes uh, to study and now starts a PhD or is doing a postdoc or something like this. I cannot uh, tell here, just go ahead and do open science. There, there is basically a huge, a huge gap of um, skills required and skills available for doing open science. I would even say this is the, the, the key part for pushing open science is actually to make people at first aware of all that give them the knowledge and also the skills to make their research open, reproducible, fair. And that is not easy and that, that is actually, actually is very tough, but I think the carpentries are on a good way. So one, one key message here, I just maybe, maybe put this in here first. Um, to open up science further, we need better incentives. So we have the, this the kind of motivation. We need solid infrastructure, and we need training to equip more people with these necessary skills. So if we look at the third part, um, the the key term that is that needs to be used here is data literacy. And uh, maybe if you're not really familiar with that, data literacy is the ability to collect, manage, evaluate, and apply data in a critical manner. That is a quote by Ritzdale, who basically. Uh, put the theoretical foundations for that. Um, I prepared your yeah, kind of overview also uh, generated or actually based on, on Rinsdale, where a few, uh, or w which is kind of an yeah, overview of, of the parts required here. And again, this looks, it, it is very busy, a very busy slide, and that is exactly the point that I want to make here. And um, that is not easy. It is actually quite a step to bring somebody um, to the level that he or she can actually apply uh, 
these skills in order to make research reproducible. And there are a few things in here. So you, you need a conceptual framework. Right? You need to know what is data. You need to know how to collect data and what you need to uh, take care of in terms of metadata. So you need to manage the data later on. And later on, you also need to um, apply or let's say first evaluate, then apply the data to decision making and all these kind of things. So this is, uh, I don't go too deeply into the, into the details. I just want to make, make clear that um, there are a lot of com uh, um, competencies needed in order to make the step, in order to make um, data really useful. And while we have an explosion of data, we don't necessarily have already everybody equipped with the skills for handling this data. And that is, we have here a research focus, but that is everywhere in society. And as a critical citizen, actually, I, I should have these kind of skills. Yeah, just by carrying around a phone that is uh, tracking my, my movement and so on. I, I, um, I'm leaving a data trace and I should be aware of this. And maybe I should develop methods by myself to critically think about all that. And basically this, this uh, data literacy is kind of a future skill for everyone, but especially in science where we generate uh, lots of data and, and where data is our key uh, material we're working on, these kind of uh, skills and uh, competencies are essential. And we need to bring this to, to everybody in, in, in research actually. And luckily we can do this. And luckily, basically, the carpentries are, as mentioned in the very beginning, are, in my opinion, the organization that is driving this in, in, in a broad spectrum. And um, as somebody in, involved in or using all the different lesson programs, I can uh, really say that I'm more than happy that this organization exists. Um, I use this for my my um, uh, lectures I do, uh, besides normal normal uh, workshops in the classical carpentry style, I put this into my lectures. And that is really great that we have uh, the content, but also the methodology. And this is the methodology is my opinion key, because you can apply this to different contents. And um, I really cannot emphasize this enough. I have several, from my own experience, I have several workshops and, and um, lectures where I basically apply the methodology without, let's say, using precisely the, the content, but just the pure methodology is key for a very efficient and um, also relaxed way of teaching. So I can um, just motivate people, if you're not using this, do it. Luckily, um, I'm mostly talking here to people from our community. Um, and also, the clearly, the the um, content that we provide is key, and I will jump into this in a second. So uh, another key message by teaching data science and data literacy skills, the carpentries help to lay the foundation for broad adaptation of open science and the FAIR principles. Basically, since two decades already, and this is the cool thing, it's really visionary, since more than two decades, the carpentries are dedicated to drive this equipment of researchers and people in information-centric um, roles in the adaptation of these skills. And that is really, really great. And I would say we should go further and we're doing this already. So uh, it's, it's what I propose here is nothing new. I just would like to make people more aware of this. Um, by collaborating with research, training, teaching communities, the carpentries uh, can even bring this further. And we, we are doing this. So this is not, not a new, new thing. Just um, I would like to bring this here to, to everybody's attention. There is a lot of uh, things that uh, we, we can address, but the research committees are often or have often very dedicated needs and there's not not always one size fits all. I think personally the the uh, software carpentry lessons are great for building this general foundation and then well data carpentry on top or let's say library carpentry on top um, or parallel can be a great solution to also individually. So in terms of uh, research committees can generate solutions that bring these kind of skills to the communities. And that is, I think, also well designed already that we have solutions for this in hand. And what this precisely means uh, is the, the Carpentries Incubator. I, I really um, am highly impressed what is happening there. And if you are not aware of this, I would warmly invite you to check this out. It's um, really something where everybody can benefit. And that would be my, my call to the community to think how you can contribute there. If you, if you are connected to one uh, research community and you build up um, content teaching material there, 
I personally would highly recommend use the carbon trees incubator for that because it follows a, a, a proven structure that is very, very helpful for bringing um, content to people. Um, it's building upon our methodology. It's, it's part of that. And it's also a way of uh, addressing a broad audience and just very practically speaking or, or talking from, a, from somebody who's writing grants from time to time, th that is something that is a big selling point. If you generate content and let's say 50 students are benefiting from this, this is nice. But if you generate content and a global community is benefiting from that, that is, that is impact, that is important, that is something funders also see. Um, and it's clearly a win-win situation, while the community has a much deeper impact and can efficiently address and bring these skills to their community. We as Carpentries um, have, have, have a growing community and basically um, a, a, a joint way of, of combining these kind of topics. And if you have not have a look at this, I just pulled out a few of my, uh, I wouldn't say favorite ones, but some that are close to my heart here. For example, managing open and reproducible computational projects. Now, if uh, that is something um, still in pre-alpha, but I look at this, 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 I will use that. Another one, introduction to command line for metagenomics. I'm involved in a larger infrastructure community uh, with a large set of uh, participant and um, yeah, partner organization and basically I, I, I will use this lesson there and we might hope uh, we might even contribute to that if, if we find gaps in there or another one very very uh, sexy topic I would say today or very hot topic right now is introduction to deep learning right so it's it's um, it's, it's basically everywhere and there's a lesson about that and it's looking for better, uh, better testers, so please feel free to that uh, to to join him. Um, so what I what I want to want to say here is the this incubator is really a, a great platform for bringing data literacy of certain communities into the broad uh, global community again, and that is something I I think is great, and more people should be aware of. And it's kind of the path of overcoming that gap that I described before. We have a lot of need in terms of skills for open science and there are general um, skills required, but there are also very specific skills and the, the incubator is the solution for, for, for that. So the key message I would like to put out here is research communities can benefit from creating dedicated content as carpentries lessons and apply our training methodology. And I can say this from my own experience and I can just warmly invite everybody doing this um, as well. All right, with this, I'm coming closer to the end. Um, I mentioned before open science is, in my opinion, the way to go. And I personally, I, I, I actually don't want to talk about open science. It's just science. It should be science. These kind of things should be standard should be default and while we all wish that we know that this is simply not possible by pushing the button everything is there even if we understand okay it is important it's it's uh, basically the foundation for solving humankind's problems it's very hard to get from where we're right now to to the situation where everything is open and let's face it this will be an ongoing process still we need to do this and i i mentioned that there are three different issues that that we are facing and as carpentry's community i am pretty sure we can definitely help here a lot with the third one so why there is no single button to push that makes everything open um let's consider it a, a nice walk uphill <laughs> um which is interesting which is challenging but that can be also a lot of fun and um, I'm pretty sure that we as a carpentries community can actually walk that and help others to walk this as well. So to repeat once again everything I, I wanted to, to show you is that um, well openness, transparency and reproducibility are key parts of science. It, it is basically fundamental and we cannot get around this and uh, we need to implement that. We also see that there are still a lot of problems, that we need to change our culture, that we need to generate new incentives, that we need to develop new, new measures, that we also need solid infrastructure that supports actually the opening of science and, and that this has to be, well, sometimes established, sometimes it's there already. 
Um, but more importantly, that the training is really required in order to facilitate open science. We need people being aware, but we also need people having knowledge and skills. Luckily, we as the Carpentries community are doing this since decades in a way. And um, that is something I'm, I'm personally, as a member of this community, I'm, I'm very proud of. I would like to invite also research communities to create more content and uh, members of this Carpentries community are often also, or most of them, right? basically everybody is also a member of a research community or of, of a library community. And um, I'm pretty sure everybody would benefit if we use the, the incubator for uh, compiling um, new lessons and bring this to the, the broad public and the global community in a way. All right, with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I like to thank everybody from the community setting this up. It's always amazing. And I, as mentioned before, I reuse content for my lectures and so on. It's, it's, making, it's making my life really easier. I just love the methodology and I can only recommend um, adapting this as well if you're, if you're somebody who has to train and teach people. That said, thank you all so much for your time. And I would like to yeah, open now the floor and like to ask you, what are your questions? Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Konrad. Thank you for sharing your perspective. I think we all want to quote you now with open science is just science. <laughs> uh, we already have some questions in the etherpad. I can read them out for you. So one is, uh, thank you for the talk. I really appreciate it, how you strengthen the role of data literacy. I agree that the carpentries can and do strengthen data literacy skills, but to which extent do you think they support the advanced data stewardship skills that are needed for open science? Yeah, that is a very good point. Um, I'm also involved in basic training data stewards and maybe for people who are not aware what data stewards are, that is kind of a new role that is, um, yeah, being established in the, in the world is, is established in the recent years, seeing the need that um, while researchers should clearly be aware how to open up their science and or research output, they sometimes need support. And these data stewards are basically the uh, supporting people helping there. And that can be a rather broad setup, but that can be also very dedicated because you need this dedicated knowledge. And I can tell you that uh, we actually use carpentry content, also the fundamental skills in order to train um, data stewards. Clearly we have to build on top of this, but um, we have we've, we basically use a library carpentry um, um, uh, workshop in the beginning to, to prime people into this direction. And I would still like to see that we also develop, let's say, research data management uh, content as an incubator. Maybe there's one, maybe I'm not aware of that, um, into, into this direction. So, so I, I, I think this, um, what you point to is, is a very good, um, or is a very good idea that we actually think what do uh, data students need and what kind of content could we generate as a, as a lesson to, to bring this there. And there's, I can tell this from my German perspective here, um, the, there are different initiatives popping up and we develop content in parallel. And I think there's now the time for a kind of a consolidation phase where you sit together and to talk. So what are your experiences with this and what could be taken out of this and, and made, made, made open public? Right? And that is again, exactly where the carpentries could shine and where a lesson maybe would be a good solution. And ideally not, not only the German um, level, but actually then, then internationally. That would be uh, actually a wish I, I have here. Mm -hmm. I hope this is answering the question and um, yes, I see a thumbs up. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, what do you think are the barriers for research to make their data, grant proposals and etc. open? Hmm. Especially with grant proposals, I mean, this means you put your idea, your research idea out there and um, you have, let's say, three, maybe sometimes five years to implement this. And if there's a very good idea in there, you could be scooped. I mean, this is definitely, definitely um, an issue where I can see problems. I put some of my, my grants out there and nobody scooped me so far, but I, I, I see that fear. Um, but one doesn't have to start so radically. One can do this maybe after the project is done. That can be already super helpful, right? If I read an, a, a grant um, that was, that was basically, or that is a project that was already uh, completed. 
um, I can still benefit a lot of, uh, from that. Clearly, it's, it's also helpful to see which grants are out there uh, if they are still, uh, if the project is longer, because then I see, okay, that, that is anyway done. I would waste my time and I would waste um, taxpayers' money in, in doing the same research. But I, I can understand that. And the, the point is we, we um, need to sometimes accept these kind of fears maybe and, and can put things out earlier or if we're brave or we just do this afterwards once, once the project is done. That might be a soft way of transition there and, if, if, and then further and further go to the early parts. And, you know, if you, if you put these kind of grants out there, that could be also part of the measurement. So if you, if you, if you are then evaluated and um, um, this gives you a bonus point, whatever, if you're applying for a position, for example. But it's not easy. I mean, that, that are just a few ideas. And maybe others have other, other ideas to do this better. Maybe. I'm, I'm answering now, but I'm very happy if somebody else also has a good idea in, in these directions. Thank you. Um, there's another question, maybe for everyone in this room. Uh, also a question for the Carpentries team more than for Konrad. How do we contribute to moving more lessons out of the incubator to the official Carpentry lessons state? Toby, I think you want to respond to this. Well, Conrad, you're very welcome to say what you want to say first on this, if you like, and then I can pick up afterwards. Toby, you're, you're the expert here, definitely. Okay, thanks, Conrad. Uh, hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, so I, I lead the curriculum team within the Carpentries core team, and I guess that makes places me kind of uniquely capable of, ask, of answering questions about incubator and, and carpentry's lab things as well. And I'll mention the carpentry's lab briefly in a moment. So in terms of lessons that are in the incubator, um, there's a page that we have that lists, and it's quite a long list, I'm afraid, um, but you can filter it by typing things into the top of each column of the table, lists all of the lesson repositories that are in the incubator. Um, and you can filter that by life cycle stages and we use these um labels for different stages of the lesson life cycle to try to indicate to people um where they're currently at and what kind of contribution could be best made to those lessons conrad mentioned the deep learning lesson earlier um and that was great to hear uh, that's in beta and so what that means is they're looking for instructors out there who can take that lesson and teach it to their own audiences and then provide feedback to the lesson maintainers about what works and what could be improved um, so that they can keep kind of iterating on that and improving. The stage before that is, is alpha, where the lesson's kind of being tested by the people who wrote it in the first place, and pre-alpha before that, where the first draft of the lesson is still being written. And in those kinds of pre-alpha and alpha stages, probably the best way that you can contribute is by getting in touch with the lesson authors and um, asking to get involved with, with developing that lesson or suggesting um, things that seem to be missing from the planned material, for example. Um, and the best way to, to, to make contact with those authors is either to open an issue in the repository itself or a lot of our community members are on the Carpentry Slack workspace and you can usually um, reach out to them directly there as well. Um, and then I think because the question was specifically about how to um, contribute to these lessons to help them become official Carpentries lessons, um, that means that I ought to mention the Carpentries Lab, which is a, a second space that we've set up for lessons being developed by the community. Um, where lessons that have gone through an open peer review process um, would be accepted into the Carpentries Lab as to form sort of a collection of lessons that belong to the community that were developed by the community, but that um, can be somehow, I guess, um, relied upon to be of, of sufficient kind of quality and completeness to be ready to be taken and taught. So I'm thinking about things like instructor notes and the accessibility of the lesson in terms of alternative text on, on figures and uh, link text and things like that as well. And so if you want to contribute to that effort, then volunteer with us to be a reviewer in that open peer review process. The only way to do that at the moment is to send us an email um, on 
incubator at carpentries.org um, and I'll type some of these details into the ethernet as well um, but yeah then we'll be conducting this kind of peer review process for these lessons and it looks increasingly likely I think that um, for lessons to be adopted as new software carpentry lessons for example um, they might need to go through that kind of review process anyway even if then they don't end up in the carpentry's lab they end up in software carpentry this kind of open peer review is a really great way for us to ensure that these lessons are, are ready really for the wider community to start using them. Great. Thank you so much, Toby, for answering this. Um, we are right on time. <laughs> um, thank you so much again, Conrad, for your great talk. And thanks, everybody, for your questions and comments on that. Uh, we will have a little break for 10 minutes and then transition over to our lightning talks, teaching tips and tricks. So I wish you all a nice little break and we will see us in nine minutes. <laughs> Thank you.